Welcome to the Healthcare IT Today CIO Podcast. I'm John Lynn, the founder and chief editor at Healthcare IT Today. I'm excited to bring you the most practical healthcare CIO insights and perspectives. We know your job is challenging and we want to help you be more successful. And today we have a special guest, an award winner. So we're going to talk about his award winning, but we're here with Dr. Tom Selva. He's CMIO at University of Missouri Healthcare. Welcome, Tom. Oh, thanks, John. I'm happy to be here. Yeah, so I want to dive into the award, but before we go there, tell us about yourself and Missouri Healthcare. Yeah, sure. So I'm a, a, I've been the CMIO at University of Missouri Healthcare for 10 years this year. been here 33 years. I actually came here to do pediatric training with my wife, who's also wow. a pediatrician. Still in practice. Uh, I think that's critical to be uh, successful in this role. Um, uh, was one of the original uh, decision makers on on purchasing Cerner as our EHR back in 1995, I believe, uh, and then uh, was medical director of the clinics when we did our ambulatory rollout, and I was in charge of that, and that's how I ended up in, in this role. Okay. As CMIO. In this role, I'm also the medical director of the Tiger Institute for Health Innovation, which is our public-private partnership with Cerner Corporation. For your, for your listeners and viewers, Columbia, Missouri is in the center of the state. Cerner is a Kansas City-based company, so it's literally just a two-hour drive to get to headquarters and work with their engineers. Yeah. Well, it's such an interesting partnership. I've talked to other people from the Tiger Institute and it's interesting you've been there since the beginning. I mean, what an evolution we've had come, right? I mean, right. I think 10 years ago we were saying, should we do EHR? You know, we've talked to, you know, other people have asked us about that partnership and, and just as an example of how that sort of close uh, relationship with a vendor can help you. We went from, uh, Hims level zero to maybe two on inpatient to level seven in two years and from zero to one on outpatient to, to, to level seven in two years as part of really putting all that effort together. Wow. Yeah. And I, I, you know, I think people look at this and say, oh, vendors, they're the enemy. They avoid them in the exhibit hall. And I understand it to some extent, salespeople are salespeople. But on the other hand, these vendors are essential to pushing what we're doing forward. In many right. cases, they're your innovation framework, right? Right. Well, and our, and again, that, I mean, I realize your podcast isn't probably about the relationship, but that, that the nature of this relationship that we have with Cerner is actually, we're part of that pushing them forward. So we take, we're their leading testing partners. So people often ask us, are you, you know, are you a hundred percent aligned with model? And we said, no, and we never will be because our job is to break the model and then give that feedback back to the company. So it's fun. It's challenging, particularly as a CMIO to manage that change management. It's a different kind of paradigm, uh, but still lots of fun. No, absolutely. It's always fun to be on the cutting edge. Well, let's talk about your award. You won the 2021 Hims Davies Award. So what does it mean to your organization to win this award, you know, for you and for your organization? Yeah, so, you know, it's, uh, it's the second time we've won this award. We won it back in uh, 2017, I believe, 2017, or maybe 2015. The, the first time we uh, went to apply for this award, we didn't win it. Actually, it was a sort of a moment of shame for us as an organization because we approached it like an IT project, right? We did not really think about it uh, the way we probably should have. So I, I sort of came on in this role after that first application. And I remember sitting down with our all of our team on clinical effectiveness and quality improvement. You know, and, and quality improvement sort of been our DNA long before it was a thing. This, you know, University of Missouri sort of always had that that mindset. Mm -hmm. I remember in this large conference table, looking at everyone at the table, I said, "Look, with all that we're doing, if we don't have a story to tell, we all need to just leave and quit our jobs because we've not done what we set out to do." But I think the real issue is it's not that we don't have stories to tell. We haven't learned how to tell our story. Wow. And, and, and many Hymns Davies award winners in the past, you know, the previous sort of construct, you had to show financial, you know, gains over time, efficiencies, et cetera, and clinical gains. And, and a lot of award winners had gone from, you know, not so great to great because they'd implemented technology, standardized, you know, procedures and policies, et cetera. We were already doing great. So we went from great to better, which is a smaller delta, right? So it's harder to tell that story. So we won, I remember meeting with Jonathan French and he and I have gotten to be friends over the years. And he said, you know, you guys did a great job. I said, great, because you, you had a great story to tell. And I winked at him and I said, you know, we have a lot of other stories too. We just haven't told you those stories yet. Uh -huh. So, you know, fast forward a few years down the road, and, you know, now the criteria for Hims davies are much more about clinical outcomes. It's less about your financials and you know, your meeting metrics. It's more are you proving that you're 
that you can actually improve the care of patients through the implementation of technology. And, and we were able to do that. And, and, and part of the reason for that is that we have an infrastructure here where we had already, again, knowing that that's in our DNA, we have a, a, a leadership group that looks at what are the key priorities for our year in improving patient care and our quality metrics. We use Vizient as our North Star. We feel like those are important, not CMS star ratings or US News and World Report, but true quality metrics where we're measured against other academic healthcare systems. Okay. Um, and so we pick 10 to 12 projects. We call them, we call them our PI and you know, process improvement priorities, insider baseball. We call them our North Star projects. Um, and, and it's interesting that we've learned over the years as we've done all this process improvement that ultimately technology uh, gets involved at one point or another. And yeah. early on, we learned that that request to the IT staff and our, and our uh, architects was coming late in the project when they'd already felt like they'd solidified their process, right? And we couldn't do it. You know, it was a massive build. It was a big customization. So we learned to embed our clinical IT architects in these process improvement teams very early to sort of help guide their thinking. If you're going to head down the technology implementation road, know that these are the tools you have so that you sort of build yourself into a place where you can be successful rather than you know, paint yourself into a corner. Right. So, so with the Hims Davies Award this time, that was clear in every one of the three projects, that the, the three case scenarios that we presented. Um, you know, the, the news alerts and reducing mortality and sepsis mortality, uh, blood utilization uh, reduction, um, and then improving screening for depression, fall risk, et cetera. All of those were clearly done with a, with a clinical outcome in mind, engaging the clinicians early, and then letting IT sort of being the enabler. At, at University of Missouri, we have this mantra that we use all the time, and we share it freely. It's not copyrighted. Is that um, everything we do is clinician-led, but IT-enabled. And I think all too often in health IT, it's, it's an IT project. We don't have IT <laughs> projects, right? We have clinician-led projects that IT will enable. And if you don't have a clinician to lead it, we're not going to do it um, because you're going to fail, right? It's just going to become yeah. sort of a pebble in someone's shoe. So, so I look at Davies as sort of, sort of like the Malcolm Baldridge Award for quality you know, in manufacturing. It's, it, it, it's more of um, it's a good structure, I think, that any organization should use, right? To sort of guide how they're going to improve and it's not about winning the award it's about the journey to get there and the award eventually becomes not a destination it's a guidepost because your work is not done you're just going to continue and you know when we won the award jonathan french looked me right in the eye and he goes i fully expect you to apply for and win this award in another two or three years because you obviously have figured out <laughs> sort of the process i'm like oh don't worry we'll be back we're on a mission but i mean it's really not about winning the award. I think making that a goal forces you to keep, you know, keep with the cadence of improvement. Yeah. It was interesting what you started, that there was some shame around not winning, which, you know, pair that with what you just said, that it's really about the process and, and there shouldn't be shame if, if you're working towards that goal. Yeah. And, right. Yeah. And then there's well, a leadership. The Tiger, I think as the Tiger Institute, you know, we sort of had this sense of like, well, gosh, you know, here we are in this public private partnership really know what we're doing and it was you know, that was where the shame was 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 that well gosh you know we really didn't approach this the way we should have we should have approached it a little differently sure. and, you know sometimes you sort of get off your game and that sort of was a pause for us to say well let's regroup and and i think everyone around the table that first time when i said look if we don't have stories to tell then we shouldn't have these jobs and everyone sort of nodded their head and went but we're doing like literally everyone said but we're doing all this great stuff and i said right mm -hmm. problem is We've been working to be, um, you know, 33 years ago when I interviewed here for residency, the residency director said, do you want to go somewhere where they tell you they're great at this? Or do you want to come somewhere where we're constantly getting better and you get to be part of that? I thought, hmm. Wow. And little did I know then, it's just, you know, wet behind the ears intern and training that that's sort of the culture of the entire institution. And I've come to know that as I've moved up in leadership. Yeah. Well, I mean, there's there's a certain uh, leadership lesson there around storytelling. So. Yeah. So let's hear, what is the story? You know, what, what did you do to win the award? What, what did the project include? What were the results? What is the story of, of your yeah. award-winning effort? Yeah, sure. So we, we looked at three areas that we thought we had done. I mean, amongst all the work we were doing, there are three areas. Again, with, with HIMSS, with the Davies Award, you have to show sustained improvement over often, sometimes 18 months to two years. It can't be, you know, we had three months of improvement. They want to see right. that you actually sustain it. 
So we had three areas that we looked at. One was, uh, I'll tell you, the first one uh, that, that Hems thought was very innovative and they'd not seen this done before. And again, this is sort of how we like to look at the world was we used clear usability heuristics on designing a tool that nurses could use on rooming patients in the clinic to assure that they were doing appropriate screening for you know, fall risk, depression, mm -hmm. et cetera, um, if it was necessary. And in the past, you know, you put a form in front of a nurse, they check it off. Often it's redundant work. They don't need to do it or they forget to do it. Well, these become quality metrics. You have to do them. So we, we used um, uh, just pure usability testing, A, B testing, different forms, getting nurses in to sit down, people looking over their shoulders, writing down, you know, their, you know, sort of the talk back as they're going through these and designed a form with a little bit of technology in the background to assure that when rooming a patient, they know it needs to be done and it gets done, it's in their workflow. So we dramatically improved all of those uh, screening rates for, so we could meet quality and pressures. Now trying to equate that to, well, gosh, did you reduce the, you know, the incidence of depression over time, suicide, et cetera. That's a little harder to pull out. Sure. Um, so that's a little harder one to tease out, although we were sort of on that journey of looking at that. The second one was blood utilization. And, and we, we recognized, so we, we had a, a director of our uh, blood bank um, who actually was a former student of mine who, um, who recognized that you know, nationally, this is an issue that we overutilize blood products. Mm -hmm. More importantly, we over order them for patients. Okay. Um, and you know, every blood, every unit of blood you give to a patient is cost and there's risk, right? There's always a risk yep. for um, a reaction. So one used national standardized criteria for sort of thresholds for uh, when you should, should transfuse a patient. Um, built a very simple but very effective user-centric alert that tells you you're about to order blood. Here's the hemoglobin for your patient right now. Here's where it's been. Um, are there reasons you're overriding this alert? Here's four that are the most common so we could track that. And then here's a link to the guidelines for transfusion. And so sort of a stop and think, you know, there was massive education behind this. And sure. then as we, as we tracked sort of who was constantly overriding it, we could do much more focused re-education. You know, when you meet with a department and you tell everybody, hey, you're ordering blood too much, you know how it's like any other educational process. Everyone looks around and goes, well, it's not me. <laughs> and yes, it is you, but we're, instead of calling so you we out, need the data. Here, so this could be education that could occur in their office with the door closed. You know, you're not calling them out in front of their peers. And so... Um, a lot of culture change, a lot of education, re-education, meeting with departments, sort of what we call the sort of road show to get that 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 momentum moving. Um, and then we, for the Hims Davies Award, we focus specifically on our orthopedics institute because we have a freestanding orthopedics hospital. They do a lot of surgeries, many of them are outpatient, um, lots of blood utilization, uh, and so focusing on if we do this effort, can we reduce their utilization of blood products? Now there was one little one little niggle in there, and that was, well, what if the patient is already anemic before surgery? How do you how do you get them sort of ready for surgery? So this again is an example of the technology was a small piece. It was really about the process and the people as yeah, all. Yeah. So one of the holdups was if someone's anemic, how do I address that? Well, they need to see a hematologist, and you know, there's a there's a whole process to slow down. So with mutual agreement between the physicians and the, the hematologists. If we put in a simple order that said patients getting ready for surgery has anemia, that would immediately get them scheduled within the week. So wow. the hematologist could work on what's the source of their anemia, how do we turn this around so that when they go to surgery, which is often elective in orthopedics, right? They're really their best position for success and they don't need you know, transfusion. So what we tracked over time was a steady decrease in the use of blood products. Um, we eventually moved this alert to include fresh frozen plasma and other blood products because we, we saw that it was, it was effective. And what we also saw was we, well, I should say, what we did not see was an increase in length of stay. So length of stay uh -huh. continued to fall over time. As a matter of fact, if you, if you, if you transfuse a patient inappropriately, you're probably going to increase their length of stay, right? It takes time to do the transfusion, sure. get the blood. See the, the result. result. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Exactly. So that was the second case. And then the one that was probably the jewel in the crown was the implementation of the national early warning system uh, in, our, in our EHR. Um, and Ben Wax, who's one of our clinical informaticists, this was his passion. He came here to do this um, and he wouldn't stop until it was live. Uh, so he gets a lot of the credit as, as well as many of the nursing staff who worked with him to make this come alive. 
the national early warning system is not uh, some machine learning algorithm. You know, we talk about the news algorithm. It's really a scoring system of, of, of information that the nurse is already capturing in their workflow. And that was the key issue. You're not asking the nurse to do anything more than he or she would normally do at the bedside. That score gets calculated and then displays in front of the nurse. And we sort of have these, these um, ranges of low, medium, high, very high. Um, and based upon what range that falls in, an alert will pop up that they can't ignore um, that will then guide the nurse through a protocol that we've agreed upon throughout the hospital. Here's what you do. Here are the things you can order. And this is when you call the rapid response team. Um, and so that alert displays everywhere for providers, nurses, it's on the tracking boards, it's on the ER tracking board, patient status boards. But because we standardized the process and standardized the response and sort of made it our culture here, what we saw was the activation of our uh, rapid response team, which we call our tiger teams because you know, the university is <laughs> right? Makes sense. Um, that went up. Our uh, sepsis related mortality went down, which was unexpected because news is not a sepsis alert. It is an early warning that the patient is having decline. Doesn't tell you what it's from. What we found was that our SERS alerts were not very helpful. And so news has now replaced that as sort of the alerting mechanism. Our uh, code blue uh, activations dropped significantly as our tiger team activations went up. So, so we uh, have had, you know, our odor E ratio has improved, mortality rate has improved. Um, and we, we attribute a lot of that to the news algorithm. We've now expanded that to the pediatric early warning system, which has taken a, I just had a reference call early this morning with another hospital where they've struggled that we used a modified pediatric early warning system. So we're, we're continuing again, a good project is one that not only succeeds, it's one that succeeds and then you can spread it across the organization. Mm. So with news, we implemented it in the background for two years silently constantly meeting with nursing staff and physicians. Are we over alerting? Is this threshold appropriate? Then moved it to one medicine unit. And then, okay, it's part of our process improvement. We said, okay, can you move it to a unit that's different and it works? Okay, if it works in two different units, we now think it's appropriate for spread. Let's uh -huh. talk about how we're gonna do that. So now it's just, the, it's just the way we do it. I mean, everyone, we even had requests for, can you use the new score as a means to determine if a patient can leave the ICU? And our answer is no, you still have to go look at the patient. So, <laughs> you know, but, but it also, one advantage too, is that it addressed the issue that more and more our bedside nurses often have one to two years of training. So they don't, they're not that seasoned 30 year veteran who can look at a patient and just tell you that patient's going to decline. Why? Because I've seen it before. They haven't. So this gives them a little more to say, you need, it doesn't tell you what's wrong. It says you need to look closer, sort of, sort of, as I like to say, apply the machine between your ears, because that's incredibly well trained. And then because we know you may not have the experience of knowing what to do next, we're going to guide you through that. And, and as I mentioned to the hospital this morning, you do have to go through the other parts of the process of getting your executive committee, the medical staff to approve that this protocol can be used by nurses to order a panel of imaging labs, fluids, et cetera, before the physician even arrives at the bedside because that's, you know, minutes matter. Right. Those are the, those are the three clinical stories that we used for him uh, to win the award. That's beautiful. And, and the last one is super interesting. Uh, as someone who was in the hospital with uh, my son and the nurses came in and they would say, you know, I'm not allowed to say this, but I've seen sick children and he doesn't look sick, which he wasn't. He ended up being fine. But, it was, right, right. but to your point, it's so interesting when they are. How do they how do you scale that insight to someone that's new? Right. Uh, so that's a really interesting approach that you've taken. Well, and we had, you know, when you put the word algorithm in anything with hymns, you know, it leads to a lot of oh, <laughs> machine learning. And I had to keep, you know, Ben, Ben and I both had to keep saying there's nothing machine in here, right? This is not machine learning. It's not deep learning. It's not, it's not random forest. It is simple scoring uh, a group of individuals at each institution sort of deciding where your thresholds will be. And then, you know, we, you can nuance it. So on your progressive care unit where, you know, your patients are sicker, you're going to, you're going to basically agree uh, we're not going to fire the alert until it's high or very high because that's in, you're going to over alert and fatigue the nurse yeah. who already has a lower ratio of patients to take care of because we know those patients are sicker. 
Um, with pediatrics, it's a little bit tougher because you know you have developmental issues, age-related issues as children change. Uh, so what's the norm? And so we've had to sort of tease that out over time, but um, so far it's been working very, very well. Yeah. Sounds like, you know, you've learned something that I, I've heard. I think I actually heard it first from uh, the CIMIO at uh, UC Denver, uh, C.T. Lynn, who talked about, you know, like, let's not throw out the baby with the bathwater, right? There's always exceptions in healthcare. Right. And, and it sounds like that's what you bumped into. And the process to manage those exceptions is the key to the success of this project. And, you know, I mean, let, let's talk about it. We've known about sepsis for a long time. We know it's right. a problem. We have all sorts of data that says this is a problem. Right. Correct. Exactly. <laughs> you know, why has it been such a challenging problem to solve? Is it those exceptions that make it hard to really, you know, address it in the system? Or, or what do you see as the problem here? Well, I think, you know, as we had in the conversation this morning, there's lots of factors. One is that you sort of have to, you can't let perfect be the enemy of good, right? So you can put a, you know, we have the St. John sepsis algorithm running in the cloud. Remember that these algorithms and sort of warning systems are only as good as the data that feeds them, right? So, you know, we're fortunate here at the University of Missouri, we're very uh, focused on, like what should I say, we're focused on technology. We're very technology enabled. We have tens of thousands of devices feeding our EHR live, right? So the bedside monitors feeding live data to the EHR. So, so the, the ability for that algorithm to give you a warning earlier is much more enabled because the data is live, it's real time. But many hospitals don't have that level of integration. So the nurse is rounding, they're taking vitals, they're putting them down. They may or may not be, have the time to put them in the EMR, right? So, so the algorithm is essentially blind to that data until somebody puts it into the system where it can see it, right? Yep. It's not unusual for nurses on busy floors, four hours later, they're finally having time to chart. Yeah. So that's where the data gets in. And now the algorithm can tell you, hey, this patient's declining. Well, they were declining four hours ago <laughs> or maybe have declined <laughs> since. So there's this gap. And, and, and so the algorithms, you know, that sort of in the cloud works when the data is fresh and it's real and it's live. So we're, so we're lucky to have that. So that's, that's part of the struggle. Um, you have experience issues with your nursing staff, et cetera. So, so that's been part of the issue with dealing with sepsis. And then the other part of it is, um, you know, every unit's going to be different, right? Do you want a sepsis alert to go off in, you know, the ICU? And the answer is probably not because you already know they're septic. That's sort of why they're there. Now we do, we do have the news scores displaying in the ICUs. They may not be alerting, but they're displaying because it helps. Uh, one is again, it's just a reminder. You might want to look a little closer, even though the patient looks fine. You might want to look a little closer. Um, Two, in the ICUs, it can be uh, amongst the many other tools that are out there, SOFA scores, Apache, all that. Um, it's another tool to say, you know, does this patient need to come into the ICU? Does this patient, do we feel like they're really ready to leave? Let's go take another look, right? So that's always the other part of, did you actually go look at your patient? We've actually taken the new scores and embedded it in our ER triage. So if you have an outside, we, you know, as, as the University of Missouri, we're in the center of the state. So we have St. Louis and sort of Kansas City on either side of the state, the big metro areas, Springfield down south. But we basically take patients from all over the state at many small rural hospitals. So they're calling to transfer a patient. If the new score is calculating in real time from the data they're giving you as you input it into the system, you know, it gives you the opportunity to say of all the patients waiting to get into our hospital because we're, we're we're fortunate that we're almost always full. Um, we've been sort of bucking that trend that, that other hospitals are shrinking and we continue to grow, but it helps you decide maybe I should take this patient before this other patient because mm. they look like they're closer to clinical decline. During COVID that helped quite a bit with sort of triaging who we could take, who the local hospital may keep a little bit longer while we tried to you know, make room for their patient here. So it has lots of applications. And again, it's all about sort of managing the, 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 the people in the process, right? The technology is just there to assist. Yeah. So let's dive into that a little bit more and maybe expand the conversation a bit, talk a little more broadly, not just these specific uh, sure. Hims Davies Award projects, but kind of more in general, what do you see as the role of a clinical informaticist in, in really kind of the transformation of healthcare? You know, I think we're seeing that in a big way. COVID prompted a bunch of that, right? And, and saving lives. And how will that continue to evolve? Yeah, you know, there's been a lot of chatter uh, on the AMIA uh, sort of news groups and, and uh, texting channels about, you know, the clinical informaticists, you know, what's the role they're going to serve. And should they, should, they be able, should they be forced to do a, a fellowship? You know, they still have like mm. 
my colleague and I both here. So one, one of our group here was already a board certified clinical informaticist when he joined our team. The other two of us weren't. So we made it a stretch goal one year that we're going to go get, you know, we're going to grandfather in. Uh -huh. um, you know, could we have gone back to do a fellowship? No, because I think my wife would have just shot me dead if she's like, your, your salary is going to go down to what when you're for two years as a fellow? Like, not going to happen, right? Yeah. So, because I think that we have to give credit to those like me and some of my colleagues who've been at this for a long time. There's, there's, that is your fellowship, right? right. But what's the role of the clinical informaticist? And I think, you know, I think it, it varies, and this applies to whether you're CMIO or not. That, you know, as I was explaining to a group, uh, uh, from overseas this morning that you're sort of, in, in many ways, you're the Rosetta Stone, right? To say that uh, IT and healthcare are not two separate things, they're one and the same. Um, if we step back for a minute and think about what do we as healthcare providers do, whether you're a nurse, doctor, respiratory therapist, doesn't matter, right? We are data consumers. It has always been that way. Whether that data is you give me a history, and it is true, if I listen long enough, you'll just tell me what's wrong with you or the data is what I got from the physical exam or your vital signs or laboratory or imaging, it's data, right? So as, as IT sort of came in, it was uncomfortable because we had to get rid of paper. I'm old enough to remember paper and it was not cool, <laughs> right? It was not uh -huh. cool. Um, where we've arrived is that is that we have to be able to manage that data. That's part of our job and, and technology allows us to do that. And the technology early on was junk and it's gotten a lot better. I think we can help with that. But I think where clinical informaticists can really help is to look knowing as a clinician what you're trying to accomplish with the patient or your outcome or your process. You can look to the technology and say, here's how technology can make that better. But as a clinician, I can also say, Here's where some of our bad habits are just getting in the way and we need to change. We can't, you know, I'm going to talk to the health staff officers this evening about something. It's like, we can't keep doing the same thing and think it's going to get better. I think Einstein called that the definition of insanity, right? So, so if we're going to solve a problem, here's the technology that can do that. That's all acknowledged that we are going to have to change in order to bring this technology to bear for the better outcome of our patients. And hey, by the way, it'll make your life better too. So I think that's where, where the clinical informaticist really can shine. Understanding the verbiage that we use in technology, whether it's ontologies or whether it's coding systems or whether it's software implementation, you know, th those, are, those are things that we can help understand and translate to our peers so that they don't have to become sort of informaticists you know, on the slide. Um, but at the same time, I think it's important and doing this is not easy that you also have to stay clinically active because you know you can say i went to medical school i did a residency i practiced for a few years i did this fellowship now all i do is informatics but if you don't keep your hand in the patient care world eventually you're not truly going to be able to understand what that means yeah. um i you know it's not easy i mean i still see patients three half days a week i have this large practice that i sort of gave up to take this job and my patients don't know that because i do a lot of virtual care through our EHR and messaging uh -huh. and, and all that. And it's hard. It's hard. In our C-suite, I had this conversation one day when a meeting got scheduled when I was in clinic. And I remember saying, you know, I've been in clinic on Monday for 33 years. That has not changed. <laughs> uh, I said, and we have other physician leaders in this hallway, but I am the only one along with my two colleagues who are never off service. And that's important to consider, right? If you're a hospitalist, you're on service, you're, you're off service. We are never off service. And so that's hard, but it's important because the colleagues that I have to represent understand that I'm eating the same dog food I'm asking them to eat, right? I, and I won't ask them to do something I haven't suffered through first and tested and sort of right. made sure it's work. So I think clinical informaticists, depending whether you're a nursing informaticist, your RT, whatever, they're, they're, and we're rolling, we're sort of expanding our team here. We're still on that journey. Um, they bring incredible knowledge to bear that allow projects, again, IT enabled to really succeed. Yeah. I, I think it's interesting also that experience you have of being in the clinic and being, you know, in the trenches with them, right? right, uh, right. It, it changes the conversation. Yeah, you know, a simple example I heard early on it was kind of this um, situation where clinical expected perfection from IT. And then, you know, I saw someone reframe it and they said, you know what, 
care for patients has always been doing the best care we can with the limited information that we have available, whether it's the history they shared or didn't share, or whether it's, you know, whatever other information, you know, we, we've been treating patients forever with limited information. And yet we kind of expect IT to be perfect. And so, you know, I, you know, right. that's right. been an interesting challenge. And, you know, someone that's on both sides can help bridge that gap. Right. And I think there's this, there's a tendency, even in our society, that technology is going to solve everything. Right. And that mm -hmm. um, there and we and we do face a challenge with as you know, we've, called, we've called them digital natives for a long time. We can't call them that anymore because like everyone's a digital. We're native. all digital natives. Guys, <laughs> guys with sparkle in their hair like me are probably <laughs> not going to be the, not be here anymore. But but there is a little bit of a reliance to say because the system said this was OK, it's OK. It's sort of like I sent you an email and because I sent it to you, we had a conversation like, no. This is a conversation, right? right. Uh, I, I attended a, a presentation at, uh, yeah, it was at HIMSS uh, from the Children's Hospital in, I think it was uh, Colorado Springs. It was beautiful. It was beautiful. People, your listeners should download it, where they looked at clinical communication and they recognized that we live in a society of asynchronous communication, right? Texting sort of has become the way, right? Unfortunately. And so they sort of codified as their standard for the hospital staff there. And, and they have this beautiful matrix of, these are clinical situations and these are the appropriate forms of communication that can be used. And, you know, at some point it's the only communication that's appropriate is eyeball to eyeball with a nod and an acknowledgement verbally. I heard what you said, because we can't keep relying on sort of technology to be the answer when, when we are medicine is an inherently human endeavor. And at some point the best care is two humans talking to each other or two humans caring for the patient, talking to each other and not relying on the technology. But that's and that I, as a as an attending physician in an academic medical center, I always say when we complain about the resident's behavior, we have to understand that's our fault. Mm. Our job is to teach appropriate behavior, and much like parenting, here comes the pediatrician in me, right? <laughs> if mom and dad do it, then it must be okay, right? So so we have to we also have to model the appropriate behavior, and 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 you know the old adage is true: you are what you tolerate. So. Probably not something you want to put in your podcast, but but I think that's part of technology, right? Is we have to also, as clinical informaticists, understand when that is not a solution that technology should be applied to, right? That is an inherently human issue, and you need to solve that with process and culture and not stick technology in there. Yeah. It's a balance, and that's what informaticists have to do right. every day. Right. <laughs> right. Exactly, exactly. Cool. Well, as we wrap up, we like to end with some career advice, career perspective. So for you, uh, what's the most interesting piece of advice that you've learned and, or, and would share with other CMIOs or, or possibly aspiring CMIOs? Um, I would say, you know, I, I ended up in this job because um, I think that when opportunities present themselves, if it's something that interests you, do it. If it's not, don't, right? Don't do this because it's a leadership move. It's a hard job. Um, you're going to get called a lot of names. I keep a list. Trust me. When people use them, I'm like, that's number 42. I already have uh, that. I'll come up with yeah. something. You know, so, but, but I think you, you want to do this job because you have the opportunity to um, make a difference, but at scale, right? Um, you're going to interact, you know, as I was telling a young associate CMIO this morning, who's an anesthesiologist, I said, you don't have to be a pediatrician to be a good CMIO to the pediatrician. I don't have to be a surgeon to be a good CMIO to my surgeons, but I have to be willing to go walk in their shoes. So that means go to the OR, go to their clinics, sit down and listen and, and be willing to learn. Uh, and so the most enjoyable part of this job is that most of what I know now, I did not know when I came into this job, but just be willing to learn. Um, and then also remember that it, the other thing I would say is that you're, if, if you have a C in front of your name, you have a right and a duty to be at the table with the other C's. And this has happened to me a few times where, you know, because of the organizational chart and direct reports, I was left out of a meeting and, you know, being the mild mannered pediatrician, I was willing to say, sure. And then I stopped and went, my job is to defend those individuals for whom this system is being built. And if I'm not in that room, I'm not doing my job. So I went to the person I report to and said, I need to be in that room, get me in that room. And, you know, it wasn't like a big battle. It was just more of my sure. sort of overcoming my like, wow, am I supposed to be there? You know, so so uh, that is not always the case in, in, in organizations. And I think it's important that CMIOs know that and they make it clear when they take the job 
that I'm going to be included in leader. I'm, I'm part of the leadership team. So make sure I'm included in those discussions. Yeah. Great advice. Tom, this is an excellent discussion full of insights and perspectives. And thanks so much for sharing all your experience and wisdom and knowledge with uh, our audience. And thanks everyone for watching and listening. If you want to find more great healthcare IT content like this, be sure to check it out at healthcareittoday.com and search for the CIO podcast by Healthcare IT Today on your favorite podcasting applications. Thanks so much, Tom. All right. Thank you. Have a great day. 